J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. They'll give you their take on the writing process and how to create the secret sauce of page-turning deliciousness. Let's get into that magical mixture of the art and science of creativity. Here's J.T. Crowley, author of The Smart Kids and your podcast host. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and today I have the enormous pleasure of interviewing Jude Hayland from the United Kingdom about three of her books, Miller Street, SW22, The Legacy of Mr. Jarvis, and finally, Counting the Ways. Jude has been writing for some time now, but has only recently got involved with writing long novels. Her books cover several genres, so if you love literary, contemporary, genres about family and relationships, well, Jude Hayland is a new author for you all. So let's invite her on the show to talk a little bit about herself and her books. Jude, come and join me. Thank you. Hello, John. Good evening. And for us both in the United Kingdom, we are both on the same time level, and it's great to have the summer time with us. Indeed. Hurrah. (laughs) <laughs> at last. Jude, uh, before we get into the books, can you tell us a, a little bit about yourself and how and why you came to write these phenomenal fiction books? Well, I have been writing a very long time, but initially I was a short story writer for women's commercial magazines back in the last century, uh, 1980s, 1990s, that kind of thing, I started writing short stories and submitted them to women's magazines. I had an agent and had a reasonable amount of success. They were being published both in the UK and internationally, translated into various Scandinavian languages. I sold a couple of stories to Australia, um, yeah, but mainly Sweden, Denmark, Norway, but I'd always wanted to write longer fiction. After a while, magazine short stories are fine, but they are quite prescriptive. It's You need to write to a certain length, it needs to have certain ingredients. But it took me a long time to, well, to have the time, because I was also teaching and, and being a mother to my gorgeous son and all, all the other bits and pieces which go with, with normal life. But I did I eventually got around to doing an MA in creative writing and that really spurned me into writing longer fiction and believing that I could actually write a full-length novel which after all is very very different from merely writing 3,000 words so that is really what propelled me to leave the magazine fiction and to begin to write full-length novels. Wow there you go everybody. Um, Jude Let's um, turn to the, let's open the books. Let's see what's in this magical writing of yours. So let's turn to you to the last published book among these three books, uh, Miller Street, SW22. Now, this book shadows the lives of five neighbours that have recently moved into Miller Street. They've never met before, bumped into each other. They've never known each other. And here they are planning events to create a centenary street party. Catherine, Sam, Lydia, Violet and Francis are the main five characters in the book, everybody. They are on the committee of the centenary organising for the street venue. And it's fair to say that some of the characters have a little bit more say in it, a bit more oomph, um, a bit more forceful than others. And you, when you read the book, you'll see why I'm saying that. Um, my question really to you, Jude, is where did the concepts of the storyline come from? And why did you give the characteristics to each of these strong characters in their own right? And I'm, I'm particularly focusing here so much on, say, Catherine Francis and, and Lydia to a certain degree. Spill the beans here. Well, my because I write character-driven novels, I always start with a character. And Catherine was the first one that came to me. 
I actually was on a bus in London one day and this woman walked past and I thought, I need to write a novel about her. And I have no idea. She wasn't particularly remarkable, but that began the idea. And then I thought of the idea of Francis, the strong-minded, rather controlling character, vaguely, loosely based on somebody I kind of remotely know, I have to admit, and the character of Lydia. Now, Lydia is probably the character who I felt most driven to write about. Readers, hopefully, readers, when they read the book, will understand and see why. Lydia is an invalid at this point point in her life has recently been diagnosed with an illness and it was very much based on my mother my mother had a very long distressing illness a, a final illness um and I wanted to write about it not directly not in an autobiographical way but I wanted to make use of the emotions that being very very close to somebody you desperately love the sort of notion the emotions that 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 provokes. So that was where Lydia came from. And then I needed something to bring all these characters together because they were all sort of abstruse, had no particular connection. They don't. And <laughs> when I lived in London, back in the 1980s, 1990s, before I moved down to Winchester, where I live now, we had a street party in the road I lived in. And I remember some of the events of that street party I know, actually, but I wasn't on the organising committee, but that, I suddenly thought I could make use of that. I could bring people, because you live in a street in London, and apart from your immediate neighbours, you really don't know who lives two or three doors down. And so I thought that was a good catalyst to bring these very diverse characters together. There you go, everybody. Um, I do like Francis. She's a very bossy character, everybody, but if she was a bloke, she'd have a size nine, two feet, and put both feet in it at times. <laughs> I'm really pleased you like her because I didn't want to make her despicable. I wanted her to be real. One of those people you drive you mad, but then you forgive her. <laughs> yes, she fits those characteristics very well. Um, Jude, this book's... Let's go to the preface of the book. This book's preface, Jude, I found a bit of a mystery for... Uh, for you talk about a young man's um, last day at his work, destined for a new job abroad with better potentials. I sort of believe him do. And dare I say, nowadays, he wouldn't have driven the car home. But in 1966, that's what the norm was, driving home after a boozy night out. Yeah. Why I found this preface a mystery was, one, you don't name this character who this young man is, you just refer to them in the third person. Two, a mystery incident occurs involving a pair of shoes. And three, you touch upon the Abervan School disaster that occurred in Wales, which most of us remember here in the United Kingdom. And finally, you set the preface in 1966 when the rest of the book is mainly set 40 years later. Why the storyline to the preface and what's the significance to the rest of the book? Well, I can tell you a little bit, but obviously I don't want to give away the whole story because people will read and find out once they get to the end of it. I'm always interested in hooks from the past and how we behaved differently at different eras, exactly as you've said. People jumped into their cars. In I mean, I was a child in 1966. I I hasten to add. So was but I. Even, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just just in our cradles. Um, but nevertheless, the habits of the recipe of the times always interest me. Um, the norms and values that exist in in different decades. And that I, it, all of my novels are set in the past, in the recent past, not historic novels. And I also wanted an event which had haunted somebody their entire life, which is eventually resolved decades later. I came across a small paragraph in a newspaper when I was planning this novel about an event that had happened to a man 30, 40 years before. 
which eventually caught up with him. It was like three or four lines in a paper. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Because we do hold secrets. Again, one of the themes I like writing about is how much do we ever know each other, even the people closest to each other, to, to one another. There are certain things we never, ever really share. Um, at least I, that's what I believe. And so that idea I felt was interesting. And I just wanted something driving through the novel, which is eventually resolved towards the end. I don't want to say too much because obviously I don't do, want to give away what is resolved by that. Certain events, the pair of shoes, funnily enough, I remember my mother telling me about an event or rather telling her about telling me something that had been discovered nearby again when I was young that a pair of shoes had been found at the side of the road and a body quite far away from them and I've never forgotten that image in my head I must have been about nine or ten I'm eleven when my mother told me about this but I'd never lost that image again the Abba van I think anybody living in England at the time however young you were it's one of the earliest memories of the most appalling, shocking event. And providing you were like even seven, eight, nine, I, I don't think any of us forgot that, that terrible, terrible tragedy, especially if you were a child of similar age, which you know, I was at school, in primary school at that stage. So that had always lingered with me. I'm not quite sure now why I put them together, but it seemed to work. It seemed to fit. And I wanted to have a, a definite date that linked then a novel which was set a long time later. In 1966. Yeah. Chapter one. Um, here you start the journey of this book by introducing us to the characters, especially Catherine. Yes. Uh, Catherine Wells. She's uh, selling her house after her husband's death and moving into a flat in Miller Street. And here you introduce us to domineering Francis. I love Francis. <laughs> and then you've got Sam and Lydia and their relationship and the circumstances that they found themselves in and the journey back from the clinic. This is all in chapter one. But not Violet. You don't bring Violet in at the moment. Why have you set, um, for me, the opening scene in this way? I didn't want to introduce too many characters that could overwhelm the reader. I know myself when I'm reading a, a new novel, if, if there are too many people at once, I always get confused. Oh, I've got to make notes. Who's that? So I thought I wanted to introduce those central characters to get them established. But I, the other important character who, who contributes quite a lot, but it's not quite as important. We don't go inside Violet's head. We don't. We go inside the other characters' heads, so it was important for me to establish them. But Violet is a little bit more periphery, and so she could wait a bit. And I wanted to make that distinction that although she counts, she's the sort of more decorative element and a bit of fun, a bit of light relief, if you like, but not quite as important because we weren't going to know her thoughts. Um... And I thought it was enough to introduce readers to that number in the opening chapter. Because it's important, isn't it, to for an author to get the um, reader's attention very quickly. Yes. You might That's have a brilliant ending, but if you haven't got a brilliant start, they're not going to read the brilliant ending. Yeah, absolutely. That hook is all important. It is. Now, I'm not going to give away the whole book here, everybody. If you want to know what's in the entire book, well, there's a very simple answer to that. Go and buy it. So we're just picking random chapters so that you get a flavour as to what these books are. So I'm picking random chapters out of each of the three books. So it's just to give you um, a tantalising glimpse into the work of Jude Hayland. Let's head to chapter 11, Jude. Um, it's particularly interesting. You start the chapter with Francis' visit to a church. Hmm. Um and, you know, to, and, and also there are letters here to a Charlotte Prido. And you're also talking about her former husband, Andrew. Now, I said, Francis interests me. 
that's why I picked this chapter. With her, you know, with her, you know, her approach to things and how um, she copes with um, various things like, and she's desperate to know about the relationship between Sam and Lydia, but she's a bit, bit of a bull in a china store going about this. But that's what I love about her. <laughs> and I think this is you ratcheting, ratcheting up the tension, um, twisting the storyline uh, to keep the readers enthralled. For me, it embodies the essence of the book. What's your thoughts here about this chapter and why did you write it in such a fashion? Yes, I felt it was important to see Frances for all her annoying habits. For a start, having her sitting in a church gave me a chance for her to reflect on her thoughts at that moment. And I felt Frances is somebody who, who likes to be establishment. I could see her sitting in her pew in her Church of England because this is what you do on a Sunday morning, put your smarter clothes on. It seemed to fit in with how she saw herself and how she wanted other people to see her. Um, so that established her. And as I say, it gave me a chance to have her reflect about what's going on in her head. Um, and then, of course, it also gave me a chance for her on the way back to bump into one of the other characters, because if they're inside, I mean, they're all living in the same house, but the house is a ha has been divided into flats, so they're not going to see each other. So it's the plot device of simply getting them outside and bumping into each other to have a conversation. And I, secrecy is an important part of the novel. Each of them keep secrets from each other. They don't know each other well at all. They're beginning to get to know each other. Um, some of the, she's got a very big secret. She doesn't want the others to know. So mm -hmm. has Catherine in her way, less major, but nevertheless something she doesn't wish to share. And it's this is a chapter I think where you're beginning to, hopefully the reader is beginning to wonder a little bit more about how everything fits together. The letters, it's quite interesting because the character of Charlotte, who was going to be very minor, and is still relatively minor, but, but Charlotte and Andrew, they began to become more important as I was writing the novel. And the letters was a way of including more about their personality plus um, Francis' personality. So I feel chapter 11 is a point where things are stirring. It's the last chapter. I've divided the novel. I've structured it in four seasons. So we have, we start in autumn, we go autumn, winter, spring, summer. And that chapter 11 is the last of the winter chapters. And then we move into spring. So it's kind of quite a quite an important pivotal moment, I feel. I see. Hmm. Because it's interesting. And yes, I know what's in the books, everybody, because I've read them. Yeah. But the whole idea <laughs> of the concept here is for us to tease you. Yes. So as you click at the end, of the podcast down to the Amazon link and buy. Can't Please. be plainer than that, can I? Exactly. <laughs> You're doing a good job. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I love marketing. Let's go to chapter 21. And it's a Saturday. It's the 15th of July, 2006. It's seven o'clock in the morning. Violet has returned. Here she comes, everybody. Frances starts to ponder about her future once the street party with... All its planning comes to an end. She ran Andrew, her previous partner's business, in relation to admin, and her mother's inheritance won't last forever. Please tell us, Jude, what's going on in this chapter, or should I say, please tell the listeners what's going on, for I know what's going on, having read the book. I think you're winding up the characters here, aren't you? You're starting to do it and pull it yeah. together. Absolutely. If if this was a crime novel, it, it'd be when you discovered who did the murder. But it's not a crime novel, not by any stretch of the imagination, but it is where everything comes together. Everything begins to link. You know, the pieces of the jigsaw are gradually fitting together. Um, resolution is happening. I mean, the novel does never completely resolves. It's reasonably open-ended the way all sort of modern novels are. I mean, it's it's not Reader I Married Him in, in the, the way of a Victorian novel, of course. But nevertheless, 
characters, the mysteries in their lives are being resolved. There is a certain amount of, of, of climaxes in this chapter. So it's, it's very crucial that gradually we are beginning to see the wood for the trees, as it were, things are beginning to become clearer um, for the reader, hopefully. And if, been, if they have been wondering, what's that person's relationship with that person? I don't quite understand that. Hopefully this chapter will make everything, it will clarify. And it does. It, <laughs> good. It does. It starts to do that, everyone. <laughs> Jude, let's go to another one of your books. Now, The Legacy of Mr. Jarvis. Now, this was the second book that you wrote. Now, I found this book full of intrigue, deception and deceit. Yeah. And again, like in Miller Street, you start the book off in 1966 with young Mary, daughter of Jack and Ida, and, you know, who suddenly there's a house move. And, you know, and they move from London to the South Coast. Hmm. And again, 40 years later, Mary learns something about her mother's past. A half-sister appears on the scene. Who was Freddie Jarvis from her mother's past? And was she a legacy of Mr. Jarvis? Hmm. Did you enjoy creating the storyline and the characters to this book? I did, very much. Thought you did. Again, <laughs> it's that business of enjoying looking at the past. Um, I don't write novels set in 2023 because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, I like looking back to times when I haven't yet written anything at, in an era when I haven't been alive, however young I was. So I enjoyed again capturing the flavour of what it was like to grow up in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, because I think people's concept of the 60s is often very different than the reality for most people's lives. The 60s might have been all about amazing happenings and free love and flower power if you were a pop singer, but for most people, it was just the 50s rehatched. Um, it, it, there weren't huge changes, and I wanted to capture some of that, but still, life was quite dull and hadn't changed that much. It was only 20 years after the end of the Second World War, which is 20 years is nothing, and the attitudes hadn't moved on for most people in most people's lives. So I, I was interested in that. Um, the South Coast, my grandparents actually lived in Brighton and the late 60s, early 1970s was a time I very much remembered what it was like going down to the South Coast. And I was a child of that era. I hasten to add, my parents weren't nothing like Mary's parents at all. <laughs> we had great fun as, as children. Um, but it, I don't want to write about people I know. I want to create characters. But I did know, I remember other people's parents like Mary's parents. Um, everything very, a little dull, a little correct. As I say, my father was a journalist. Uh, my childhood was very different. But the ones I, the childhoods of friends I viewed were more like Mary's. I enjoyed the detail, what shops were like, how much things cost, all all those things that I could talk about, the clothes people wore. Wasn't it the hot but pants? I, Weren't the hot pants coming out in that time? So, yeah, well, that was late. That was sort of 70s. Yes, early 70s. Absolutely, early 70s were, yes. We went from sort of knee-length skirts to very mini skirts to hot pants. So, yes. And flare trousers. I did want everyone. to capture that. But I wanted the dual time. Now. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Um, oh. So all those details I enjoyed. Wow. Why did you write the preface in italics? For me, this is a fundamental part to your book. Would you agree? And so yes. why the italics format and the upfront message here? Why? Well, I'm not sure italics, I would do it again, quite frankly, which is an interesting thought. Somebody said they find italics hard to read on a purely practical level. But that aside, I felt it very important to create that sense of mystery from early on, again, to hook the reader. Um, the fact that something was been and that Mary wanted to find out what it was. It seemed to be important to establish the dual timeline of the novel from the very start. So the preface is the later date of the adult Mary, and then 
switching to 1966 of the child Mary, I wanted to get that established in the reader's mind from the beginning so that the dual timeline was, wasn't was going to come as a shock, chapter three or something like that. It was there from the start. Wow. Um, chapter one in this book, uh, Jude, um, I'm going to read the first paragraph. Um, so it starts off with, this is where I have to begin. This is where the story of the past has to start. After all, before we moved to the house that ate sea view parade to live close to the sea, our lives were blithely ordinary with nothing note to recall. We were simply Ida and Jack Foster. My normal, predictable, faintly dull parents and me, their only child, Mary Elizabeth, whose dark brown wavy hair refused always to lie straight and was skin that was prone to freckles. And we were living normal, inconspicuous lives in our semi-detached, pebble-dashed house with a bit of garden at the front and some more at the back in a suburban slice of North London. But then the tea chests arrived. Mm. Do you think, my question really to you, Jude, here is, do you think that between the preface and this Chapter one, this is a powerful opening to get the readers to turn again into, to get into this book. Well, I rewrote it many, many times. And I, interestingly enough, I originally, although this is my second novel, I originally submitted early chapters as part of my MA. Um, and again, that's the reason I rewrote them. And I I played with doing something more complicated. And in the end, I decided I actually wanted a very ordinary, factual statement. Because following on from the preface, it's clear that Mary needs to go back as an adult. And she's. I needed to cast the mind of the 11 year old thinking as the 11 year old. So I wanted to make it quite simplistic and straightforward and to get the facts there. But then the tea chest arrives, hopefully hooks people out of just, oh, normal dull parents, where's this story going? How much can we read about dull people? And getting it onto a more interesting level, hopefully. I, um, it's It's quite hard writing about people who aren't, exciting I suppose in some ways but it was very important to get the prosaic nature of their lives but hopefully the preface had already linked into the idea that there was something being hidden so I played with it and I read eventually after changing it hundreds of times that's what I came down to so I hope it's worked I think it's worked dude let's Thank go you. to now when we chatted and we were working together to put this podcast together. I asked you what chapters would you like to concentrate on so as to give the listeners a fair understanding of what this book is about. Well, as I said, we can't and we don't want to go into all the chapters. We would be here forever and a day, quite frankly. That's not the whole idea. It's a tantalising tease, everybody, and I've said it before. But you said, Jude... There was one significant and essential chapter that you wanted to talk about, and that was chapter 16. Why? For it's about the policeman's visit to Jack and Ida's house and some fascinating news. Now, don't give it all away, but tease yeah. us here. Dangle the carrots. Why this chapter? It's pivotal. It's pivotal for Mary. Because Mary's life is predictable and normal and ordinary, she thinks. And she gets up, she goes to school, she does her homework, she has her friend Eva, and things are going fairly normally. And then this chapter, where everything suddenly shifts, and she begins to think that possibly things aren't quite as she assumed and from then on, everything becomes quite muddled. As you say, I have to be very careful about what I say. And her shifting views of her parents, their relationship, her understanding of her father, of her mother, 
of her immediate surroundings is thrown into question. So it is a very important chapter, one that I rewrote several times to get it right, because Mary's got to remain ignorant, partly ignorant of the truth, but the reader's got to know enough to make them curious. Um, and of course, it's not till later everything links in, but it's it certainly is a very important, it's it's a mini climax, um, one of several, yes. It is, and it's very well written, everybody. Now, what fascinated me in chapter 23, we are skipping through the book, everybody, uh, Jude, was the um, the letters. Yeah. Those two letters. Yeah. They're in italic. Very briefly. Why? I wanted the sense that to leave to the reader afterwards a certain question as to which way Mary goes. There are two directions her life, you could say, can take at this point. And she's considering, without giving it away, which direction to take, whether to delve further into something or whether to close the door on it. And I wanted to, I was not sure myself as the writer which way Mary would go. And I wanted to leave it to the reader so that they could resolve themselves which way they thought Mary, which decision they would make. And actually, it's proved very useful for book group discussions, I've heard, because uh, book groups get very different people think, oh, no, I know Mary would have sent this letter. No, I think she would have sent that letter. So I wanted it to be equivocal, to leave the end up to the reader in many ways. And it saved me from making that decision. And I, again, it's the yeah. open-endedness that I quite like. Life is often. So and so the re you know the reader can say, well, what would I have done in that situation? Yeah, I think Thank it's you. brilliant. Those two letters. That's why I wanted to bring them in there. Thank you. Okay, everybody, let's go to Counting the Ways, the third book in the podcast, but Jude's first book. And again, it's very different. So the prologue and the first chapter, like in any good book, rightly sets the scene with sufficient enough to want the reader to inquire more into what the book is about. Do you, Jude, think that the prologue here in this book, where we see Archie introducing Grace, the two main characters, to an idyllic home setting in Jacob's Bottom, after being married for 16 months, and chapter one, which starts off with Grace could not particularly remember the planning that had taken them to Jacob's Bottom, does that... And what's so special about that opening scene? And again, do you think that was powerful enough to get the listeners, the viewers, the readers intrigued? Because it got me. Places are very important in this novel. Oh, places are always important in my writing. I just, I'm always intrigued by buildings, homes, houses. And certainly the different locations in this novel are very, very important. So I wanted to establish one of them from the beginning, which is this Jacob Spot, which is a name that just came out of, I don't know if it exists. I was say, where did you put that from? <laughs> I know, I don't know, I don't know. I don't, it just, just occurred to me. Um, so I felt it was important and to establish something about their relationship that Archie appeared to be in control at this point and Grace is quite so much submissive because that sounds as if she's repressed, which she isn't, but she's happily um, taking the lead from Archie at this point. And I just wanted to establish her, her character, his character. And I feel in the detail and the way they react to each other and the way he has chosen this place for them to live and how she agrees to it, it seemed to be very key uh, considering what happens later. So it seemed important to me to, to establish the place, the place needed to dominate. You did, indeed. Chapter 10, Jude. Now, I found this chapter curiously fascinating. Hester, which is Grace's mother, has for some unknown reason accepted a dinner invitation from a Kenneth Harper. He's a rich, repellent, rude man 
who thinks having snared his prey is onto a winning streak. But this topical discussion that he has around the dinner table and his manners leaves Hester very cold. So much so, she storms out of the restaurant. And I think most women at that stage, if they had gone to that dinner, would have picked up a glass of wine and chucked it all over the bloke. She writes a letter to her distant husband, Fergus, of 30 years. I think she still has feelings for Fergus. Am I right? And is this the reason you set the scene here in this chapter? It's, no, I'm not going down other relationships. I still have an inkling, a leaning to my past. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm a bit of a romantic at heart. And I loved writing Hester. She became more important in the novel than I originally intended her to. And I could, I could understand Hester. She's a strong woman, but Fergus, even though they have been estranged for years, he is still the man, the only man she's really loved, however much he's been remote and been doing his own thing. So, yes, uh, there is this residual. I think she discovers that she does still love him, even though she's almost not conscious. It's almost a subliminal love that's there. And, of course, he's the father of Grace, of her, of her daughter, her only daughter. So, yes, I think there's a little bit, not a little, quite a lot of her residual love for Fergus is 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 it there in the novel and in her character? Because Fergus is adopted for a, you know, a, how shall I say it, a simple life on a Welsh hillside, growing his um, um, vegetables and things. Yes. He's sort of like opted out of society, yes. which we'll come to in a second. Now, I want to move on to chapter 21, because for here, we have a new scene. We're on a Greek island, everybody the island of Kronos. Grace has had her baby, who I believe you don't give any clue to the name or the gender of the baby. Hester has come to visit her daughter, but there's a long telephone conversation between Hester and Fergus about Archie. Now, Archie is um, Grace's husband, everybody, who has... Um, gone away, disappeared. There is a... You need to read the book to see what Archie's character is all about. Yeah. But there is this conversation and about the status of Grace's husband, Archie, his state of mind. Um, Jude, could you briefly tell the listeners what's going on here? Where are you taking the storyline here? Well... Archie has disappeared, absolutely. And we don't know why or what's been going on at this point. They are, it is this fictitious Greek island, although the terrain, the landscape is very much based on Crete, which I know very well indeed. So there's an authenticity in the description. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but Again, it's to do with this complexity of relationships. How much do we ever know is going on in somebody else's life? How much do, do people share with each other? And one of the underlines of the premise of the novel is the secrets that we don't share um, a lot of the time, even with the people who we should share because of shame, because of pride. And again, I think Hester and Grace have this in common, this, you could, could say this this love for somebody is not necessarily with them this understanding and forgiveness and the, the I have to just say the name and the gender of the baby eventually gets resolved at the very end so you have to keep reading to the last page to find out but it's an important chapter because it does establish I suppose the patience the love the endurance of these two very strong women I mean Grace seems quite as I say submissive at the beginning but she proves herself very strong and enduring um but their their values I hope come out in this chapter the importance of the child uh it is quite hard to say a great deal without giving a lot away but yeah I mean Hester is a mother she's now a grandmother and the sort of family love is is very strong in the novel and 
the love in relationships, the forgiveness, the understanding, the complexity of family relationships. Which is oh, basically... the complexities of family relationships. Don't you love them? The ups and the downs. Yeah. As they Absolutely. say, you can pick your fra- you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. <laughs> Uh, Jude, which of the three books do you like the most, or should I say, had the most fun in creating both the characters and the storyline? I think probably my third. I enjoy them all at the time, but in retrospect, I think I felt more confident because it was my third novel. And the storyline, I knew exactly what I was doing with it from the beginning. The structure was clear to me. I didn't lose my way or didn't start again. So it's not to say that I don't still think fondly of the characters in my previous two novels and the legacy of Mr. Jarvis. For some people, that's their favourite, but I would probably go with my third. Wow. But as I say, I do have fondness for all of them and I wonder how they're getting on with their lives now. <laughs> <laughs> what's next um, for you, Jude, in terms of writing? What's coming down the line? What can people expect? I'm working on my fourth novel, which actually is complete. I'm currently editing it, or about my fifth or sixth edit. It will be going to my publisher in the next month, six weeks or so. Uh, And that is called The Odyssey of Lily Page. At least that's the title I have in mind at the moment. So yes, number four is uh, nearly the the final dotted full stop. Um, It will be coming out probably late summer, early autumn, something like that. There you go, everybody. Uh, Jude, who do you see as your market for your books? Or more importantly, who would you like to see reading your books? They've been very popular with book groups. So people who belong to book groups, who enjoy character-driven novels, who enjoy quality of language, which aren't just reading for a quick page turner of course there is a page turning element but nevertheless people who want to enjoy thinking about people's lives characters lives the decisions we make um as far as the age group um that's hard because people of all ages have enjoyed my books but probably nobody incredibly young um i would probably say 35 plus upwards to whoever reads novels but as i say book group fiction is probably quite a good label for it Jude Hayland, thank you very much for coming on the show. Jude Hayland, everybody. It's been a delight. So, it leads me to say, as usual, I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening. Wherever you're in the world, stay safe.